Good afternoon. I am Jack Long, the mad scientist. And so I put together a little bit of a video. It's kind of a long one. I did it while I had an opportunity here, trying to get ahead of the show uh, for people that's going out to the Vegas show. I am unfortunately not going to be able to, for starters, get back in country in time. And secondly, when I do get back in country, uh, I'm not going to have enough time to sit down and properly edit the video the way that I want to because, uh, let's face it, I'm, a, I'm a, a machine guy. I'm not a camera guy or actor you know, with this face. Do you think I would make any money with my looks? Um, so I put that together. Please bear in mind it is rough. Um, it was edited on my phone, but I wanted to get something out to you so that when you head into these shows that you have um, some ideas what it is that you're looking for, okay? Good afternoon, everybody. I am coming to you from the showroom of Machine Solutions here in Jasper, Indiana, and I thought that I would take a few moments to explain to some of our uh, people who aren't exactly sure what an edge bander is and what it does. I'm not going to go through and tell you this, you know, exactly how to make all the adjustments, but when you're looking at one of these machines and somebody says, well, what you need is an edge bander, and you ask them, what an edge bander is. Uh, then what I want to do is I want to be able to um, take a moment of your time and go through this and show you what an edge bander, uh, the stations are, why they're important, why we'd want to spend the money on it because the machines are um, they're very, uh, very sophisticated and uh, some of them have capabilities that you may never need. But uh, when you're going to these shows and you're, you're speaking with the sales staff, and they're telling you this machine can do this, this machine can do this, this machine can do this. Uh, I want you to walk in there with you know an idea of what it is that you're looking at and 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 what it is that you're wanting to achieve with the machine that they're that they're presenting to you. So I'm looking at this from the point of view that uh, one is that you don't know what an edge bander is, and so when I'm speaking to you from that point of view, please understand that's that's what my goal is to take somebody who has no clue and you just want to get an inkling, you know, get an ex explanation of what, where, and why. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, we'll go this far back. Those, those of you that don't know, on a panel, um, this happens to be, I think it's three quarter inch, no, maybe five eighths, double sided, but we'll have this banding that goes around the outside. And on this banding, this happens to be three millimeter, and then, so what we have on it is we have a, uh, a strip down this edge and we have a strip down this edge. And you'll see here that this is actually, if I can get in close enough, it's kind of dark. The, the showroom lights are down um, and plus I got black banding. And it's radiused on this and that is what's called um, corner rounded three millimeter banding. Okay, and it's just the, the finished product that comes off of this machine. So if you're wanting to produce something like that, you want to make sure you have the right machine that's capable of finishing your product. And one of the uh, things that you notice is this panel I had in my hand here was done with, with dark banding. It was done with black. And that should be a number one thing when you're going out to these shows. If you're out to do uh, a three millimeter banding, you're going to go looking for one of these machines. Every single manufacturer when they go to these shows, always use dark colors uh, for their for their presentation. And the reason for that is, is the dark colors are the hardest to reactivate. Uh, meaning that as it's coming out of the machine and it's produced off the back side of it, the finished product is hardest on a dark color. So uh, on this particular machine, what we have setting here um, is it's got some green in it, uh, just because it's a BSE banded uh, machine. And it's difficult to do because it's green. But if you take, imagine plastic, every time you bend it, it turns cloudy. And the darker the color is, the faster you run, the more cloudiness you get. So whenever you go to these shows, if you were to ever walk up to a machine and they are not running dark colors, first off, I'd be very, very surprised. Uh, but I have seen it. Um, 
that should be a clue of one of two things. The machine can't do it or the technician can't do it. I, both of those should be a flat. So we want to start with that. When you're looking at these machines, um, you want to know that the machine can do it. All right, so beyond that, when you're looking at these and we're starting at the beginning machine, we're gonna work our way through it. What we're gonna start with is up here at the very beginning. Where we are up in here, this is uh, our Edge product magazine. And if it's a left-hand machine like we have here, meaning that all the mechanics is on the left, some of the machines are set up as a, as a right-hand machine. But nonetheless, you have some form of a magazine that stores your Edge product. And this is a, a, a pretty straightforward machine as far as it has a single hopper at the beginning of it and all your material is stored here all right down as uh, as the material is pulled up we'll, we'll uh, cover up that, that in just a moment here but, and then what we have here is an in feed fence and the in feed fence is what aligns our panel so that as it goes into the machine everything is tracked off of that fence the first station that we come up against is a pre-mill and a pre-mill, if you can think from our woodworking days, um, a pre-mill is essentially like a joiner. And what it does is it takes the uh, edge of the product that may have some chips or anything like that that may be uh, a bad edge that's produced somewhere through the production line and it cleans all that up. And it's not 100% essential because they have ran them for years without them, but they the the value of having a pre-mill on a machine is, is so great that that it, it's very very difficult to find one anymore that just does not have a pre-mill uh, especially because you know everything's now going to uh the the double-sided melamines and stuff like that it's just a it's just a wonderful wonderful station uh in the correct uh, application all right so we have a pre-mill first and then usually following that is you have a heater station it's kind of hard to see it in here on this this happens to be a quartz lamp if I can get in to see that uh, you've got a quartz lamp down in there and what that does is that warms the panel as it's going through depending on where you're at in the country you may or may not want that option uh, a lot of the smaller machines don't have that and when I say smaller I mean this this to me is a is a small machine in my world this is a small machine um, but it has it on it. And so if, if, if I had a machine that was half of this physical size, it may not even have a heater on it. It may not even be an option. Okay, so what that does is in your colder climates, it, uh, as your board is cut through, it pre-warms your edge so that when your glue is applied, that the glue can stay in, in its optimal adhesion range longer. Okay, so um, this one happens to be a quartz. Right, so beyond that, after that, uh, we have a glue pot um, application system on this particular machine. And glue pots are very, very common. We have a tank that's down in here, and this has got molten glue. Um, it's kind of hard, again, to see it in here because, of the, again, the showroom lights are, are down. Um, but what happens is you take your glue, your hot melt adhesive, and it liquefies it. And on the back side of this is a spindle, applies it to the edge of your panel. Okay. After that, we have um, continuing forward with my magazine for my edge tape that I had had up here. It's fed up into a control mechanism. This happens to be a pin roller, similar to this. Some of them are rollers that are actual rubber rollers. Some of them are belts that uh, have a track feeding system in here. This one is, um, it's got some intelligence in here because of the material management system. So um, it's a little different. But nonetheless, up in this area in here, you're going to feed your tape forward. And as your tape is fed forward through this area, it is then going to go into the next station. After that is a set of rollers, and these rollers here then press this into the side of your board. And as it presses it in the board, it squeezes that glue, maintains the contact for that glue to start to cool and set and adhere. Once it does, it presses it all out. Okay, then the panel continues to process through until it gets to the end of the panel, and then you have an air cylinder that's here 
that fires a knife that's back in here and you'll have to trust me if there's a knife in there because I am not going to stick my finger in there um, and that knife goes through and fires forward and as it does it just hacks off a rough length of, of your edge product separates the coil supply from what's going through the machine and that is um, called a guillotine uh, um, you know appropriately named and it just literally hacks the material off lengthwise uh, or over overhang rather then once you have applied it goes up into your interim station this interim station here is on linear rail so it falls um, some of them rise whether or not they go up or down it just depends on who who has built the machine um, it's, a, it's a fairly common style there's also some that are on uh, parallel arms that fall over and then they also have some that are called flying saws that are actually hanging on a lineal rail that then they literally fly down and chase the board as it goes now what type of uh, mounting system that you have and what kind of in trimmers is going to depend on what kind of a machine that is correct for you so in this speed range uh, where this machine is is capable of running down from the slow slow speeds all the way up into the to the medium speeds this system is is more than adequate and what happens is as we got two interim saws in here and back in this area back in here if you can barely see it down in there's a saw blade and this trimmer here as the board goes by chases the, either the head or tail of the board and trims your edge banding um, to match the ends of your boards okay we have two trimmers on this uh, machine some machines have one motor with two saws and some have one motor with one saw blade but this has two motors with two saw blades all right now the right way wrong way wrong, <coughs> can't even speak the right way slash wrong way to build the station um, there that answer that answer is depends on how fast the machine's going. So if if you are budget minded, you may find that you're going to get a machine that only has one motor with two saw blades, and that's perfectly fine because that machine is going to be um, it's not going to be very processing very fast. It's going to be tooling along at say 11 meters a minute, and no big deal. You have a machine that is running 60 meters, 70, 80 meters a minute, and it certainly has flying saws. It's up in here and this station right here which is only about half a meter wide on a flying saw uh, the stations for a flying saw will be two meters long a meter and a half two meters long and man they zip they, they just fly so the design the correct design for this depends on what what your process calls for and the manufacturers all know this they're they're, they're very good with it uh, as far as making sure it's the right you know right setup for the for the machine okay um, but nonetheless we got two motors two saw blades on this um, again it's not it's not uncommon for a single motor two blades or a single motor one blade all right then what we have in this following here is a profile station and a lot of times between this station and this station you will find a like a roughing set of a pair of motors and roughing motors are essentially like the jointer heads um, that hover only horizontally and I don't know why this machine was built this way uh, without it um, I, I would say it's probably because this is a, a, a primarily a three millimeter machine versus somebody that does uh, solid rims as well uh, but what so what you would have is you'd have a, a motor down below and a motor above and it takes a lot of your heavy excess off and allows your finishing trimmers to be able to do their job without having to um, do a lot of extra work okay uh, but this machine was not equipped with it all right this station that it does have is an axis controlled multi-axis motors um, and it's a profiling station it has that I can see in here at least pro for four the number four profiles on this cutter head that's back in here at least four that I can see um, and so what happens is, is so whatever profile you're deciding to put on your banding whether it's a little straight edge or you're going to flush trim or whatever it is this is the station that does it alright um, so with the station that 
I was describing here, what it does is take off your, your heavy excess and allows this station to have an optimal amount of material to remove. All right. What you will notice in the, the, these motors, see these motors have a little bit of an incline to them. And on your um, lower end machines, and I don't want to say cheap because cheap is, is does not do justice to the engineering that's in those machines. But on the lower end machines, the price point machines, you'll see that these motors will hang um, at zero degrees. So they're, they're, they're just cutting this way. And what happens is uh, the efficiency of the, the cutting is degraded when, when you're only cutting um, in the, in the uh, horizontal rotation, in the axis rotation. When you put this at a, at a bevel like this, it allows you to shear across your angle and actually pull away from it. Otherwise, the side of your tooth, which is creating the edge of your profile, is not as efficient. So on your more sophisticated machines, this is, is um, a much, much, much more common setup. Okay, you'll see that quite often. All right, so on beyond that, what we're getting into is our top and bottom corner rounders on this machine. And in corner rounders, what they do is they create that nice fancy profile tracing that, that we'd seen on that pan panel that I'd done. But what you'll see is there's basically um, single motor corner rounders, which is on your baby machines, your slower machines. And it is one motor that traces all four corners of your, of your part and completes it. Um, and that's fine on the smaller machines because they process everything slower and the one, one, motor, one motor can keep up. Once you start getting into your faster machines, um, up into the you know 15 meters a minute and above, um, I'm not sure exactly where they cut it off because each manufacturer is a little different. But then you start getting into this that you see here and this is a multi-motor and this happens to be two. So I got one that does the... Um, head and one that does the tail but I've got one motor for each so one motor does two profiles and what that does is allows us to process the part faster on your corner rounders we have a, a two motor corner rounder on this machine and this is set up primarily for plastics uh, your PVC's and ABS's if you were going to be doing um, solid wood three millimeter you would have uh, four trimmers and that is because you have if you imagine the blowout that's created by uh, run, running a profile cutter past your end grain and chipping it out when you run that on a two motor system you'll have a tendency to chip out a little bit of your of your wood grain so when you're going to run your three millimeter woods then you want to have four corner rounding motors Okay, because each motor, one is going forward rotation, one is going uh, reverse rotation for each of the top and the bottoms, and then the same for your, your head or your tail, so you, you wind up with four motors. Okay, so what happens after your corner rounders is you come into your profile scrapers. And with the profile scrapers, what they do is it scrapes off a very, very thin layer, uh, typically between 0.0 or excuse me, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 millimeters thick of plastic. So uh, as the profile is created by your, your trimmer motors, whether it's the corner rounders or your profilers, depending on how the machine is set up and how you run it, uh, the profile scrapers go through and they scrape off the mill marks that's created by these cutters. Okay, and when that happens there's a very very thin amount of, of plastic it gets pulled up and we'll see if we can do we have any in our hopper no they've cleaned their hopper okay so um that's what your profile scraper does and this is a very important um distinction between a three millimeter machine and a non three millimeter machine so i have had over the years, a lot of people have came to me and said, hey, you know what, we're going to start running three millimeter on this machine, and the machine is not, quote, unquote, I'm going to throw a pair of air quotes up in here, it's not a three millimeter machine because it does not have this station. If you cannot take the three millimeter radius um, and scrape it and finish it, it's not, quote, unquote, a, a three millimeter machine. You may be able to put it on, 
it may process all the way from the beginning of the machine all the way through all and come all the way out the back side and be applied but when you see a machine with and without a properly set up scraper it is a world of difference um, and it, once you see that difference you understand why you're going to need this but I have that question comes up a lot with, with people who are picking up secondhand machines first to them but it's a secondhand machine and and they, they read on there that they can put on up, up you know up to 5 16 for, for instance which is is a bogus thing because there is no inches in the in the edge banding world it's all metric um, so they get this and they say hey you know I should be able to put on eight millimeters but you're telling me I can't put on three millimeters and and it's not that you can't put it on it, you cannot finish it so that's what this station does is this station is the finishing for three millimeters and this is a, uh, a fairly nice very very heavy heavy stations you will find um, that scraping stations are are considering um, that all they're doing is taking off a very very fine amount they're very very robust everybody builds them very robust because it needs a, it, it is the final say on how your product is it is just as important uh, as far as the quality of the manufacturing of the system as any of these stations up here are even though all it's doing is taking off a very very small quantity all right uh, the next station back in through here and I wish I had power on this machine that I could show you but this is a set of, of flat scrapers and what the flat scrapers do is um, as the the glue is squeezed out up here when it's applied um, at the side pressers sometimes you get a little squeeze out on the top and the bottom of your board and as it goes through the machine whatever is left by the time it gets done being processed comes into these flat scrapers and what the flat scrapers do is just remove um, the squeeze out of glue they they are not for finishing the panel they are not for cutting any any wood or any plastic anything like that they actually never make contact with the panel at all if they do something's wrong all right so what they're doing is they are taking off excess squeeze out so that when you get into the next station which is your buffing station back in here you see these cotton wheels uh, if I can get in there well enough that you see it cotton wheel there and that cotton wheel you, you got a pair of them you got one on each of these motors and what that does is um, if you can imagine picking up a panel taking a rag and then wiping it down it and then cleaning everything up that is what that is supposed to do one of the the misunderstandings that, that people see is that they're like hey I got buffing on this I can just clean the panel up and but there needs to be air quotes around clean because it's supposed to take a good panel and make it better it's not supposed to make a take a bad panel and make it good all right so what it's supposed to do is if you were to pick up a rag and go down your part like that that's it that's pretty much it if you have glue squeeze out that's not what they're for uh, if you have chips or bad cuts that's being produced by these trimmers up here that's not what these are for matter of fact when I go in and I train somebody we turn these off and these are really never turned on until uh, you know an hour or so before we're ready to sign the paperwork when we're doing our setups our trainings um, everything like that these are never these are never turned on because um, you can hide a lot of sin that's down in here with these if these are not adjusted correctly so when you're setting up and you're tuning and you're doing all your adjustments you do that without these um, because they can hide a lot of stuff now the machine should do its job just perfectly well without this and then that way when you turn them on everything is better okay so we take a good panel we make it better we don't take a bad panel and make it good all right a another station that this machine has on it is a hot air system and you'll see in here it's a single single hot air gun and they they split it here and up inside these are some heat resistant tubes and they run up if I can get my hand in there close enough to it you'll see the two nozzles we got one for the top one for the bottom and what these do is so we were talking about the the plastic as you're cutting your plastic and, it, and, it, and you bend your plastic it turns cloudy these two stations help reactivate that so that as you're running your machine that um, that you have to do less cleanup and less handwork at the end of it okay so when you are cutting your plastics 
your PVCs, which is when I get back to them. The very, very, very beginning, and I say that the, at these trade shows, they always do dark colors because the dark colors turn cloudy, and then when the, the machine does its, its job and it comes out the back end of it, this heater back in here helps reactivate that plastic and and shows you as it comes out the back, like that, that black that we had on my panels over there on the floor. When you're doing your blacks and your blues and, and things like that, dark, dark reds, they're very, very hard to finish as they come out the back. All right, um, so you go to these shows and if somebody had, um, they were putting say beige or they were putting white or light gray or something like that around a panel, then when you get back to this area of the machine, you cannot tell if if the machine is actually doing its job correctly because it has the wrong color banding on it. So one of the things that the manufacturers make sure of is that when they're demoing these machines, they're making sure they're always putting on their hardest product because that's what their competitor is doing. And if you ever walk into a, a, a booth and they're putting on uh, beige, or here's, here's a sample down here, um, of the white three mil and this is probably here because they were doing some demo days and it's you know it's an economical product to run but if you ever go to these shows they don't ever run this I mean here's some that, that this is the green that they were doing at this show as well and you can see see the quality of the edge it was come off it was really really producing a nice nice product as it comes out um, but if I ever walked into a booth and this is what they were running on the machine I would be very, very uh, suspect of that machine, either the, the, the um, technician or the machine, one or the other. Okay, um, so I thought I would take a little bit of your time here. Looks like we're uh, gone all the way around the machine and explain to you basically, you know, what to look for when you're walking in a machine. So when these guys are talking to you and they're, and they're, they're shooting all these fancy terms at you that you know what it is that you're looking at. Going through this machine, I realized we did it kind of quick. Um, going through, I wasn't looking to teach you how to run the machine more. It is that when you're going out and you're wanting to purchase one and you're talking with these, these salespeople and they're, they're rattling off terms back and forth, uh, a lot of it can be overwhelming. So I just wanted to make sure that you have a, um, an opportunity to understand what it is that what each station does so when you're buying it, that you're not buying too small of a machine or too big of a machine, because either one of them is a waste of money. If the machine is too small, you gotta go buy another machine. If the machine is too big, then you're just wasting capital sitting there. Okay, so um, hope you found this beneficial. And if so, you know the, the things to do, like, subscribe, comment, especially comments. You have questions, reach out, let me know. Um, if it's a question I can answer, um, I'm happy to do it. And if it's something that I don't offer or already know that I don't have an answer to, it gives me a chance to go out and learn something new myself. Okay, so hope you have a great day. And as always, go make a million.